You know, we, 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 we pray like this and we sing songs of response for the reason that we believe that our God is a God of action. He hears us when we pray and we trust that our God cares enough to be moved towards compassion to then take action and go out into the world. And that's good news for us. I mean, a lot of people think about different presences and forces and worship different gods and really have this uh, idea that there's something out there that's aloof and something that maybe has power but doesn't necessarily care. But that is not the God we worship. We worship a God who is alive, who is active, who works. And we believe that he invites us in to partner with him in what he's doing. And that is incredible. You know, God doesn't need us He can do it all on his own, but instead he chooses to work with us. It doesn't mean that we can sort of bend him to our will either. He's still God. He will accomplish his will and his plan, but he is a good and loving God that he created his people with gifts and abilities and passions to take action, to partner with him where he's going to build about his kingdom. And it gives us purpose and it gives us meaning and it should give us, oh, so much joy as we get to sing these songs as we get to live our lives. And today what we're doing is we're actually going to be studying a passage of scripture that allows us to see how God does act, to really reinforce for us this idea that God is a God of compassion, that he is also a God who acts out of that compassion for the good of the people who love him and who have faith in him. So if you've got a Bible, open it up with me to Matthew chapter 9, verse 18 to 26. And here we're going to see a a story of sort of two intertwined stories of as Jesus went about his time teaching and living on the earth. And here we see that he'll display his power uh, of life over death, his power of healing over a severe medical condition in one person's life. And we'll see that he not only restores people to society and to life, but to a life with him. And so this is going to be a good passage for us this morning. So if you got your Bible, follow along. If not, on the screens behind me, we're going to look at verses 18 to 26, where we read this. While he was saying this, that's Jesus, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, my daughter was, uh, has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. So Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. So Jesus turned and saw her and said, take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and as she got up, news of this spread all throughout the region. This passage for me is an incredibly encouraging passage, because as I said, it reveals the character and nature of God. It shows us that he does care about people, and sometimes he's even willing to be interrupted in order to respond. Out of his compassion, Jesus raised someone from the dead. And along the way, he healed a woman who had experienced such a severe medical condition that she was on the outskirts of society for at least 12 years. I think this is the message that we need to hear today. I think a lot of us are facing a lot of things where we look at, at sickness and hurt and sadness and brokenness in our world. And, and we need to be reminded, as I said, of a God who cares and wants to be involved. And, and hopefully, by extension, those of us who are followers of Jesus will learn to pick up some of these traits that Jesus had and we will respond to our world in the same way. So let's see how this scripture can do it by first coming into verse 18. We see as we pick up the story here, we're in the midst of a series of seeing Jesus traveling around, teaching and interacting with people. And and we pick up where we left off last week. If you were with us last week, you might remember that Jesus had been out uh, and he was in uh, his hometown and he's chatting with some leaders. And these are religious leaders who are very passionate and fiery about what their convictions are. And this just so happens to be 
his co- Jesus' cousins' disciples, his followers, uh, are coming and they look at Jesus and they've been watching him and they see, hey, this guy isn't, he's not living the way that we live and have expectations for a religious leader to, to behave. And so Jesus launches in to uh, an, an explanation of why his disciples live the way that they are living, why they're choosing not to fast. And as he's answering all this, what he's in the middle of doing is revealing to the Jewish leader and to the people who are gathered around who he is. He's saying, I am God. I am very present amongst you and you want to be with me. And in the midst of this, we have this interruption that we read in verse 18. We see that there's this prominent Jewish leader who comes from the outside and pushes his way, obviously, through the crowd and comes up to Jesus. Now, if we were to read one of the parallel accounts, and this is paralleled in both Mark and Luke, so if you want to go later this week to study this more, you can go into Mark chapter 5 and as well into Luke, you can find the story there. And we see that it's revealed that this is Jairus. This interruption isn't just sort of an average guy, it's the big guy. Jairus is the head of the synagogue, which means he is the pinnacle of the religious establishment. He is the upper 1% of the society by far, and he is in power, he's in control, he has influence, he's the guy you want to be beside in any situation because he'll get you through. And here, in the midst of Jesus saying who he is, Jairus comes up to confirm it. Now, this isn't really Jairus's Uh, meaning or desire, we see why Jairus is really coming is actually for his family. We see that Jairus has come rushing up to Jesus because his baby girl is dying. He comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, my daughter's dying. Please, please come lay your hand on her so that she can have life. Now we read it as well in Mark and Luke's account to find out that this girl is just 12 years old. And 12 years old is significant time for a young woman in this day and age. At 12 years old and one day, a woman is, a girl now becomes a woman. And she is recognized as being in the prime of her life in their society. And so when Jairus comes up, he's not just coming up and saying, hey, I've got this older daughter who's sick and facing difficulty. He's coming to Jesus and saying, my baby girl is in the, and she's dying, and I don't know why. And so he runs, and he pleads with Jesus. And we see Jesus' response is not one where he dismisses someone who's interrupting, that he's bringing the revelation that he is God himself, but it's a response of love and compassion to someone who would call on him. As Jairus says, please come, Jesus gets up and follows. And this is incredible. I think this is incredible because I think so many of us view God as someone who's too busy for us. He's got too much going on, and so I don't want to bother him, or why would he possibly care about me and what I have to say? But here we see that Scripture reveals the true nature of God is a, a God who loves and is invested in those who will call on him, and he doesn't just hear him out, but he responds and takes action to come and meet this man's need. And so we see Jesus gets up, as do his disciples, and they leave the midst of this very prominent and important interaction to follow after Jairus to head home to his home. And they start to walk, and we don't know if to travel, but we see that as he gets up and starts walking, that another encounter takes place in the midst. We see that as they're rushing onward, something stops Jesus in, his, in the midst of a whole sea of people. 
And I don't think this is a coincidence. I don't think Matthew was just writing down the gospel and recording everything that Jesus had to do. And it was just like, oh, here's a fun tidbit to insert into the middle of this story. Matthew is a very intelligent person. The man who penned this account of Jesus' life is trying to get us to understand profound implications that should shape our understanding of who God is and how he works in our world. And so when he puts this in, it's not just sort of a throwaway. It's not a throwaway moment, but we can view it as sort of just an, an, an add-in, but what's really happening here is this encounter allows Jesus to do two things. For starters, it allows him to give a foreshadowing of what he's about to do. As Jesus comes upon this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, he's able to show that he actually has the power to heal, which will build anticipation, surely, for as he goes to see this dying girl. But the second thing this allows to happen is that it allows the girl to die. And that seems really morbid. Like, why would Jesus want to allow a girl to die? Well, I believe Jesus wanted that so he could reveal who he truly was and what his power actually meant. That it wasn't just to provide healing to someone with a sickness, as significant as that was, but it is the power to bring life over death. And so when Matthew includes this little bit of a story, we see that there's profound implications for us. In verse 20 to 22, we read this. Just then, this is as they're rushing towards Jairus' home, just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I could touch his cloak, then I will be healed. So Jesus turned and he saw her. He says, take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Now, this must have been great. I mean, this woman is going through a lot. For a, what would be a difficult season of a few days for the average woman once a month is now carrying forward for 12 years. This woman has a chronic illness, which is leaving her in physical agony and anemic she would have been low energy she wouldn't have been able to really help herself we would know that she would be just uncomfortable but more than that she's actually thrown out of society because of this there was rules in the Jewish laws, in the one that's found in Leviticus 15, for example, which says that when a woman is having her period, she would be considered unclean. And so she would not be able to touch other things, and anything that she did touch would be unclean, including clothes or sheets or even another person. And this would leave somebody rendered unable to go to the synagogue, to worship God, to take part in community life. And so for her to go through this situation was, yes, physically torturous, but it was also emotionally and socially very difficult. She would have been outcast. If she had had a husband, he would have certainly divorced her for one of two reasons. One, she would make him unclean and cut him out from being a part of society. Or two, she wouldn't be able to have kids during this time, and a husband did not remain with a wife if she was unable to provide a child. And so she would have been kicked out from her home, and now not only is she in pain, not only is she low energy, not only does she no longer able to go into town and participate in normal activity, but now she's had all of her support system pulled out from under her. In that day and age, a woman could not support herself on her own because she wasn't allowed to work in the same sort of way. So she would be kicked out of the city, left to go glean along the sides of the field, whatever she could pick up, and that was how her life was going to be. And so when this woman comes up, and she comes up to Jesus out of desperation, we can start to get a picture of, of really how bad the situation is. Mark and Luke's account actually take it further in telling us that she had spent every cent that she had going to di different doctors and all of them told her that there was no cure. So she's coming and she's running to Jesus. She's moved by this, 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 this presence that is in the midst of a people and she says, this must be my answer. There's nothing else left for this woman. And so as she comes in to the place, into the midst of a rushing crowd, she reaches out for Jesus and she knows, perhaps if I touch even the corner of his cloak, I might have a hope. 
there might be something there for me. And we see what does Jesus do in this moment? He stops. Again, Jesus is rushing. Life and death situation. He's already been moved by compassion of a father who has come to him because his daughter is on her deathbed and he stops and he takes notice. Here's a woman who needs me. And he responds to her out of love and grace by providing her healing. And we see what once kept this woman from society, what kept her bound in physical agony, is broken free from her body. She's now free. She's now free to live a healthy life. She's now free to get to take part in society, to come back to her family and friends. She is now set free from a burden that she was told by doctors would never give her release. But because Jesus stopped, because he saw her and loved her, she was able to be set free. But what's even more profound, I think, than this is something that we don't catch in our English translations. In the Greek, this word, when Jesus says, your faith has healed you, that word healed has a double meaning. That word in the Greek can also mean save. And I believe this is very explicitly stated as Matthew comes in and he writes this account to tell us that when Jesus had this encounter with this woman, he not only came to set her physically, emotionally, and socially free, but he came to save her spiritually as well. Out of her faith in the one true God, Jesus brought her out of a place where she had no family and adopted her into the family of God. He took her from a place where she had no provision into the presence of the king who would provide everything for her, not just for one day, but for an eternity. When Jesus stops out of his compassion, when he chooses to take action, it changes a life not just for a moment, but for an eternity. This is a profound teaching. We should be celebrating already at this point. We should be getting excited about what Jesus can do. Surely this woman's life has been changed. Surely the community is going to be celebrating. But Jesus has something even bigger in store. And so after healing her, after speaking to her, after giving her dignity when everyone else would have considered her unclean, Jesus continues on and he comes to be the Savior to a little girl. In verse 23 and 26, we read, When Jesus entered the synagogue's leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, Go away! This girl is not dead, but she's asleep. But they laughed at him. But after the crowd had been put outside, he went in and he took the girl by the hand and she got up. And news of this spread all about the region. So we see that Jesus is, is come. He's followed through with being compelled by Jairus to come and see his daughter. But when he arrives, it's not the warm welcome that you might expect. Again, if you were to read this in other accounts, you would find out in the way that it was written that this girl was on her deathbed, but she died along the way. Matthew's included that all. It actually says when, when Jairus came to Jesus, he recognizes that his daughter's dead. But, but we see that, the, that what Matthew's doing is he's expediting the story. He's saying as they come, there's already been all this stuff that's taken place. And what's happened when we see that there's these people playing pipes and there's all this noise and commotion is we see that a funeral is taking place. Remember, we're in the ancient Near East. It's hot. It is scorching hot during the day, and if someone dies during the middle of the day, it gets stinky. It gets gross. Bodies start to decompose. And so what they had was they had people on call for funerals. You didn't have a week or two weeks. You couldn't find the right day for family to come together to give a nice tribute to somebody. What happened was as soon as someone died, a funeral had to take place. And so we see, because Jairus was a man of influence, because his daughter had died, that the funeral had already begun to take place. And so they've hired in professional mourners. They've hired in these people who would, it was their job to come sit at a funeral and just wail and cry to emphasize the family's agony. There were musicians there to cover over, to draw attention, to allow this thing to take place. And so when they arrive, this is what's going on. 
Now, and, but Jesus' perspective is far different. It's far different than the social custom of the day. It's far different from what the family who is there without Jairus seems to believe. While they believe that this girl is dead, Jesus said, it's not done. Jesus knows she's dead. I mean, this girl is not breathing. Her heart is not beating. She is not on a lifeline. She's dead. But Jesus communicates in his words that there's something else. She's not fully dead. She's just mostly dead. The story reminds me of the great movie, The Princess Bride. Anyone seen it? Yeah, I'm dating myself a little bit here. But I love this scene in, in the movie, The Princess Bride, with Miracle Max. What happens is the main character, Wesley, ends up almost dying. He's dead. And his friend, Inigo Montoya, ends up scooping him up with Andre the Giant. I forget his name, but they, they scoop him up and they carry him to Miracle Max and say, there must be a miracle. What can you do for us? And Miracle Max looks and he studies Wesley's body and he goes, ah, well, there's good news. And he said, there can't be good news. He's dead. And then when, that's when Miracle Max responds, whoo, hoo, hoo. The good news is he's only mostly dead. And there's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is still partially alive. With all dead, well, with all dead, there's only one thing you can do. You can search his clothes for loose change. And then he gets to work. It's this great scene that shows for us that sometimes there's a reality beneath the surface and sometimes there is a hope where there is seemingly no hope. And this is what Jesus speaks into the situation. He says, you look at this young girl and all you see is death, but because of who I am, I see life. And so Jesus says, get out of here. And they all laugh at him, right? Like, they're like, this is reality. This isn't a fictional story. This isn't the princess bride. This is history. People look at him and they say, this is a dead girl in the Middle Eastern heat. You didn't get here in time. Jesus, you're a nut job. And Jesus says, no, I'm not. And he goes on to prove it. And clearly the family agrees. Clearly Jairus is still has some faith because it says that the people are kicked out of the home. That these pipers and these mourners end up going outside and there in the silence in just the presence of Jesus, he is able to reach out and take a girl by the hand. And with that, he brings her back to life. Jesus takes what the world said is dead and brings it back to life. And he does this because out of Jesus' compassion, he can take action that can supersede anything that we can possibly think about, that we could possibly dream about. Anything far beyond what we could possibly comprehend is made possible with the person and power in the presence of Jesus. And this was not just good news for a family way back then, but it's great news for us today because Scripture tells us that before we come to faith in Jesus, every single one of us is dead in the grave. It might not be talking about physically, but it's talking about the reality that we all face, that every single person from creation till now, till the day Jesus will return, that every single one of us is dead in the grave because of our sin. But the good news is that out of God's loving compassion, that he can take action and that he can bring us back to life. In Ephesians chapter 2, we read, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following in its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But, gotta love this, gotta love these phrases in Scripture, but because of his great love for us, God, 
who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this is not from ourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You and I, friends, were never able to save ourselves. We can't give ourselves CPR when we're dead, but Jesus certainly can come. He can raise us from the dead. He can restore us to new life. He can carry that on for eternity. He can shower us with his incredible riches, all for the purpose of his glory, because when God takes, shows compassion, he chooses to take action. This is truly the greatest news that the world could ever receive. And if you are here today and you have yet to enter into a saving faith with Jesus, you need to do so now. You need to hear the message of what this story is trying to communicate, which is the reality of the life that you live, that without God, you are dead in your sin. But because Jesus came, because he went to the cross, because he died in your place, because he enabled you by his grace to have faith, if you would turn to him and say, Jesus, I need you to bring me to life, he will take what was once dead and give you new life. No one in this place should leave today without receiving what God has done, without receiving the hope and healing that he can bring. You can pray it where you are. You can have a conversation with him. If you don't know what to say at the end of the service, I'd love to meet with you up here at the front and I'd love to pray with you and we'd love to talk with you because we believe that the hope that Jesus can bring to your life will truly renovate you from the inside out and bring you so much healing and give you so much purpose and bring so much joy to your life. We need to receive the message of Jesus. But this message of Jesus is bigger than us. It's farther than us. Who Jesus is isn't just a savior to us, but he's also an example. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we go to scripture and we study it and we look at the, the life that Jesus lived and the life these people of faith lived and went, wow, wasn't it amazing back then? And we forget that this was all also written down for Jesus not just to be our saved, to be people who are also moved by the compassion of our loving Savior so that we go out and take action. This is what our lives are one for. It says that we were once slaves to sin, but when Jesus receives us and brings us into new life, we become slaves to him. And that means that we participate in the work that God is doing for his purposes because that is what fully brings us to life. So where are you lining your life up with the compassion of Jesus? You know, one of the things I think we sometimes do is we, 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 we under-spiritualize our life. We start to sort of compartmentalize these different things and we say, well, church is over here, but the other things I care about are over here and we separate the two. But I believe that God is very intentional in how he designed us and how he equipped us and even the things that lay on our heart as burdens. A burden isn't always a bad thing. Sometimes what happens is as we look at the world, we see things that are, are broken and they're wrong and they're unjust and they're just not right and those are the things that as we look at them, God looks at us and says, that's what I want you to go be involved in. That thing, that person, that place, that project that you have passion for, those people you have compassion for, that is who I'm inviting you to go to. That's where I'm inviting you to take action and bringing about my kingdom. These two things aren't two different aspects of our life, but it's the whole of our life brought together when we see that out of compassion we should take action at the example of Jesus. So what's your heart bleeding for? What's the cause that you see today that's driving you crazy? Is it for the people who are sick? 
Is it for people who are shut in? Is it for the addict who is experiencing the incredible crisis that we're facing in our community? Is it for the homeless? Is it for the hurting, the people who are experiencing injustice in some part of your life? What is it that causes your heart to break as you hear the news, as you see people in our community? What is it that is drawing you in towards God's compassion? It's going to be different for every one of us. We don't all have to have the same thing, but whatever that thing is, is a thing that should lead us to action. As you look and as you feel that burden, as you feel that twinge of angst and pain, what are you doing to step into it? What are you doing to embrace the call that Jesus has placed on your new life to go in and bring the message? Yes, none of us can bring the hope and healing that God can bring on our own, but God invites us in to bring his message to be bearers of good news. As we go and we meet the physical, the emotional, the relational needs, we open incredible doors to be able to share the good news of who God is. I'm constantly astounded by some of the conversations we get to have here at the church when we do things like the Red Tree Pantry. As we meet people who come in and they just need some some groceries to help them get by for the month, we're able to open up some conversations that are quite incredible and profound. We've had opportunities over the years to pray alongside people, to invite people to know who Jesus is. When we hand out those boxes, we get to put scripture in and we encourage people. I remember while one gentleman uh, got a box and he came a number of months and, and we put a Bible in. And then the next month we put a Bible in. And, and by the last time he's like, you know, I don't need these Bibles anymore. Why do you keep giving them to me? I said, because I hope you'll read it because that is what you truly need. The groceries are here to help you get by to the end of the month, but that's what's going to get you by for life and eternity. And the incredible thing is that guy went away and he read that word and changed his life. That's just one example of what we all get to take part in. It's not just what happens here at the church. It's wherever we are all compelled to go out of compassion that God lays on our heart. And God will do it. He tells us he wants to see his kingdom come. He wants to see his will be done. He wants to see his name glorified, and he wants us to come in. So won't we take action? Won't we get involved? Now, if you're here and you're saying, but I don't have something, Kyle. (laughs) I don't have that thing that that drives my heart towards compassion. Well, then the thing I would urge you to do is first and foremost be driven by the compassion of who Jesus is. If you are not a compassionate person, I don't think you fully grabbed hold of what God has done for you. God has done something so incredibly merciful and gracious in dying on the cross for you that that should inspire you to what's next. Grab a hold, read scripture, pray about it, wrestle with the Holy Spirit, invite him in to convict you and to move you in the way that his heart bleeds. Invite the Holy Spirit for a heart for a certain person or people group or place or project and then be open to exploring and having conversations with different people and allow the stories that you hear to stir up your heart. And if you don't want to wait, just get involved. There's all sorts of places that we can be involved in the mission of God, in our church, in our community, and around the world. There's all sorts of agencies and projects and places that have incredible things going on in, and we can just go and get involved. And what I have found in my own heart is that I have gone on places where I've I've gone on mission trips and I've gone to serve places. And sometimes I know very little about the people group that I'm going to. But once someone comes to me and they say, Kyle, I just don't have the time or I don't know the place, I look at you and I go, then what are you doing with the gift God's given you? We've all been given the time. We've all been saved by a loving Savior if we have put our faith and trust in him. The question is, what will you do with that? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for what you have done in our world. God, we thank you for the story of how you you gave hope and healing to 
to, to that woman and to that young girl and God, how you have restored their lives. God, we thank you that the woman who experienced such outcast and, and, and such shame and, and such a burden for so long was received by you because of her faith. And God, we thank you that you didn't just bring her wholeness and healing in the moment, but for eternity. God, I hope one day when I get to heaven that I get to ask her some questions because, Lord God, I want to hear the story and I want to hear the joy that she brought. But God, I pray that as people here who are gathered, who worship you, who have received what you have done for us, Lord God, that we would go and we would share those stories while we still live, that we would communicate the joy and hope and healing that you have provided to us as, as we are moved by compassion towards the people that you are calling us to. God, I pray that you would lay on every one of us a, a burden, a conviction for something where you want to use us. And God, would we be so emboldened by your spirit that we would step out and take part and God that you would bring hope and healing to those places in the power of your spirit in your name Jesus for the glory of the father and Lord God I finally ask that if anyone is here today and they have not received your great love your great sacrifice if they have yet to to come into faith with you Holy Spirit would you move them now to receive God, would you create in them a new heart? Would you restore them from death to life so that they can be a symbol, a, a life lived for your glory? God, we thank you that you are a God worth worshiping, that you are a God who cares and is active. And God, we thank you that you take action. We pray this all in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.